Would you guys stand for the reading of Scripture? You can open your Bibles to Luke 1. We are still in chapter 1. We will continue to be in chapter 1 for a while longer. We're going to begin in uh, verse 39 and read all the way up through verse 56. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along using the screens to my right and to my left. We read, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. Go ahead and take a seat. You pray for us. Father, I pray as we continue to study your word, as we continue to read and work through the gospel according to Luke, that you would continue to give us a a greater certainty about the things that we've been taught, but also a greater confidence in the finished work of Jesus at the cross. Pray that you bless our time together this morning. Pray that you prepare our hearts for the effect of your word. Pray that we are convicted and encouraged in appropriate measure. We thank you for our time together this morning. We pray all these things in the name of your great son. Amen. Amen. Good morning. morning. Have you guys ever received good news that seemed like it was too good and so you were suspicious about it? Like someone tells you something. (laughs) Okay. Have you ever heard of Movie Pass? I signed up for MoviePass before I could be sure it was not a complete scam. Like I got one email, gave them my credit card information. They were telling me, for like 10 bucks a month, I can see unlimited movies. And I was like, I'm going to run this company into the ground. And so like, it didn't seem real to me. It seemed like a scam. I gave them my credit card. And the way it worked seemed kind of scammy. They're like, you give us your credit information, we'll send you a debit card. And you're like, OK. They're like, there's no money in this debit account. And you're like, OK then what you're going to do is you're going to sign up for a movie on the app, and we're going to transfer money to your account, and then you're going to go to the little ticket machine and buy the ticket with the card. And I thought, that sounds really convoluted, but I'm going to try. And I didn't believe it was true until my ticket got printed out, and I thought, I cannot believe this. I'm going to see so many movies. My family's going to go to sleep, and I'm going to see every movie that I can. There's a sense in which I like, don't believe it's true, and I think many of us have gotten good news in our life, and we're like kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop. Here what's happening is Mary's been told by an angel that she's going to have a baby as a virgin. It's a wild claim. And I think in one sense she probably believes that that's true. An angel told her. On the other hand, she's probably continuing to wait for further confirmation that what God told her was going to happen is actually going to come to pass. I think that's what we're seeing in this passage. She responds to, I believe, fully believing and comprehending what God was doing with her in a wonderful song of rejoicing. Luke is always balancing and managing two main things. The one is this. He wants to be a careful and organized conveyor of the historical facts of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. He begins that way. He says, I've gone to all the sources. I've been to the cities. I've talked to the people. I've Uh, spent time with the eyewitnesses. I walked the places that Jesus walked. Any disciple I could talk to, I did. 
I spoke with people who met Jesus, who saw him perform miracles. I talked to people who believed that Jesus was raised from the dead. And I also talked to people who saw the risen Lord. And in many senses, it's very, very historical. When you read other historical accounts that are not the Gospels written in the same period, it's similar. People are trying to convey that what they have to tell you is true, and they're bringing evidence to bear in order to convince you that it's true. People were not more gullible back then than we are today. They didn't just believe any fantastical thing that they heard. They didn't believe any supernatural story. Evidence must be brought to bear. And and the more supernatural the claim the more evidence is required for it to be believable. If my kids say that there's a spider in their room, I'm just going to believe them and go and handle it with great courage. (laughs) If they tell me there's a ghost in their room, I'm not going to believe that. It's going to take a lot more convincing. The claims that Luke is making, that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, that he performed many miracles, that he walked on water, that he fed 5,000, that he healed people, he cast out demons, he was publicly executed, and then he was raised from the dead and seen by many witnesses, requires a great deal of hard work and evidence. Supernatural claim, a great deal of evidence. He's always balancing those two things. He begins with the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. An angel appears to Zechariah. We can, we can read this in 118. Zechariah said to the angel after he's told that that he's going to have a son. How shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Then the narrative shifts away from Zechariah and Elizabeth and it zeroes in on a young woman named Mary. She's told to behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And then they come together in the scene that we have today. Mary and Elizabeth meet. Elizabeth, pregnant with John the Baptist, who would prepare the way of Jesus, who would famously later say, he must decrease so that, or I must decrease so that he must increase. And Mary, pregnant with Jesus, whom Elizabeth calls my Lord. Look at this. In 39 through 45. In those days Mary arose, went with haste to the hill country, to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of, look, my Lord should come to me? The word that she uses for Lord there is the word kurios. It's a word that's applied to God in the Old Testament, in the Greek versions of the Old Testament. It's a word that has already been applied to God 22 times in the narrative of Luke, already uh, just a chapter in. And this is the first time it's applied to Jesus, and nearly all commentators in this passage are saying this, What Elizabeth is doing here is acknowledging the identity of Jesus as, in fact, God himself. That Jesus is not just going to be a prophet or a miracle worker. He is God returned to his people to rescue them. And that's a good reason to rejoice. So we learn a lot about what rejoicing is and what we should rejoice in when we look at Mary's song. And and the first thing I want us to see is that she is rejoicing in God's word. I like when they ask presidential candidates, what's your favorite book of the Bible? They're like, oh, I like all, I like all the Bible books. Like, what's your favorite book in the New Testament? It's definitely Job. You're like, oh. Uh. It's amazing how often they give a weird answer. You're going to get asked that question. You're running for president of America. You're going to get asked something about the Bible. Know a few things so you can give a good answer. And I think it's just actually like kind of a symptom of the fact that our culture in general does not have a very strong biblical literacy. That many people couldn't name all the books of the Bible or all the Gospels that are in the New Testament. That we don't know exactly where things happen. You can quiz each other later, ask each other where Samson, what book is Samson in? You're like, uh, a lot of you might not know that. Some of you might know that. It's a weird one, right? If you know a story is strange and you don't know where it is, it's probably in the book of Judges. Got a lot of weird stuff in that book. The point is this. Our biblical literacy is considerably low. It's considerably low outside the church. And it's also low inside the church. 
Now, I'm thankful we're a church that the way we work through texts is we, we preach them verse by verse and chapter by chapter, uh, weekend by weekend, and we hopefully allow the text to teach us and, and we allow the text to govern what's said over the course of the weekend. And as we do that, our biblical literacy grows, but 45 minutes, or if Mike's preaching, 55 minutes <laughs> on a Sunday is not going to be a sufficient amount to really grow in your knowledge of the Bible and biblical literacy. Mary is responding to good news that she believes with a song of rejoicing and it is profoundly filled with scripture. It's everywhere. You know in your Bible, those little letters that are above various words and you can look and it shows you other verses. Is there cross references telling you all the places that Mary's pulling from as she seems to just be making this song up as she goes? There's 53 either quotations or allusions in these 10 verses. That's like over five perverse? That's a lot of scripture. A lot of scripture. I'm going to work through some of it. We're going to read some, some scripture together. For the, for, the, for the first part, she's probably modeling this song off like other Old Testament songs in which people are rejoicing at good things that God has done. You've heard of Moses, right? Good. We know that God uses Moses to deliver the Israelites out from under the oppression of the Egyptians. He stretches his right hand out. He sends plagues. He parts a sea for them. They pass through the sea. The, the Egyptians go into the sea, the army, and, and then God swallows them up the sea. He's delivered the Israelites. And then, and then Moses, he leads the people in this song. He says, the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord, we'll, we'll go to the next one. Then a little bit later, you have in 1 Samuel, Hannah. You guys remember Hannah? Yes. That was good. more than Moses, weirdly. That's... <laughs> Hannah wants a child. When she's given a child, she's going to devote that child to service at the temple. And then we read this. Hannah prayed and said, my heart, look at this, looks like Mary, exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. Does that sound somewhat like Mary's prayer? So she's pulling from those things. She's also drawing from the major prophets, Isaiah. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, we read here, for thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is what? Holy. holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. She doesn't just pull from the major prophets. She also pulls from other narratives like in Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar's sanity is restored after seven years. Here's what Nebuchadnezzar says. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven for all his works are right and his ways are just and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. She pulls also from the minor prophets, the 12 books at the, the end of your Old Testament. There'll be a quiz later. I want you to name all 12. <laughs> First time I've ever cited Habakkuk from the pulpit. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. From Zephaniah. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. What set of books do you think she pulls from the most to write this song? Psalms, the one that kind of sounds like song. Psalms. Let me show you a few. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. 138, for though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. 99, let them praise your great and awesome name, holy is he. Psalm 111, he has sent redemption to his people, he has commanded his covenant forever, holy and awesome is his name. For he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Does that sound like Mary's prayer? This is a really incomplete list. I could have read many, many more passages. 
I think part of what we're seeing here is that Mary clearly treasured God's word. And this is a way in which Mary is a wonderful example to us. She certainly had the word of God read to her. She's not only hearing it or reading it one time a week. She's treasured it in her heart. She's so devoted to the word of God that she cannot help but display the word of God when she prays. She would have read it regularly. One of the things we can do is we can look at what we call like verbal cultures today, cultures that don't make much use of writing, and that would have been the case in the first century, and we can see that people back then were able to memorize much longer portions of scripture or whatever more easily because they didn't have any way of recording things. Not easily. Back then, far fewer people could read or write than is the case today. You would remember scripture a lot easier if you did not have an iPhone. to be like, hey, Siri, Exodus you know, 15, verse 1. They, they, they knew a lot, and they could remember a lot. And clearly, if they had devoted themselves to the Word of God, when they would pray, the Word of God would appear in their prayers. And you can see Mary is pulling from every various portion of the Old Testament somewhat naturally. I think one of the things that, that we see here is that what is on the inside of Mary spills to the outside when life hits her in a hard way or an intense way. Have you seen a, a little kid running with a cup, an open cup? You ever seen that? Yes. There's a cup that's like half filled with something. You don't know what's inside. And the kid's running with the skill of a five-year-old. You're like, it could be water inside. It could be milk. It could be juice could be sand from outside. You don't know. But you know when he trips, what's on the inside of that cup? It's going to be on the outside of the cup. So it matters what's inside the cup. As I was like preparing and thinking uh, about, about this passage, uh, I want to ask this question, like, what is it that I'm filling myself up with when I'm sideswiped by life? What is going to come out of me? My guess is, for many people, it's different things. Uh, We have so much stuff competing for our time and attention, uh, like probably never before, right? Am I so invested in various, like, I don't know, news channels that when life goes away, I I don't want it to go, it spills out in in anger and frustration? Or am I so devoted to my own comfort? I'm, I'm binging shows all the time. When that's interrupted by something bad that happens to me, I'm annoyed that I can't be comfortable. My scrolling Instagram or TikTok or whatever you use over and over and over again. So at the end of the week, I have, I have hours of time of putting that stuff in, in my heart. And so then when I'm sideswiped by something, what's on the inside uh, comes the outside. Mary is given really intense news, news that probably also endangers her. At the very least, it changes her life dramatically. And then what spills out of Mary is the word of God. She has allowed the word of God to disciple her and to train her. She's been devoted to it. I had a conversation with another pastor one time. I don't think I'll ever forget. We were talking about discipleship. And he's like, you know, we're, like, we're always discipling each other. And I said, well, what do you mean? He's like, when you're around someone, like you're discipling them. You're bringing the, the power of your character and personality on people and they're doing the same to you and you become like the people that you spend time with. Discipleship's always happening. We're always having an effect on each other. And now we have hundreds of things that aren't even people (laughs) that disciple us. We have like an algorithm that does not even possess a human heart that we allow to disciple us. How much like YouTube are we watching? How many hours of Joe Rogan, men, are you listening to? Oh, yeah? How many reels we, we cycle through? I would love us to be a church that when we need to respond to crisis, when we have good news or we have bad news, when we're thinking about a new event or a new change, we are thinking with the words of God and we are expressing our thoughts with the words of God that we can rejoice in this wonderful resource that we've been given, a thing that does not change, although the rest of the world will. She rejoices 
in God's word, we see rejoicing in God's salvation. Read 46 through 49. Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. She says, my soul and my spirit will magnify the Lord, will rejoice in God. She's not saying that she has like a soul and a spirit, and there's three parts to being a human. She's just simply saying, my internal being is very, very invested in making the name of God great, in praising God, and in worshiping God. It is not just an external worship. Have you ever been to like a church service from a different tradition, and you're doing lots of sitting and standing and saying things and res- like a call and response, and you don't really know the rules. I went to a church one time, and I took communion there, and when I got up, she said some sort of like, or whoever it was, said some sort of like phrase to me that apparently they do at communion. And I was like, and God bless you also, because I didn't, I didn't know what the response was. <laughs> like, we do have these external forms of worship. We, we, in some sense, like, they'll get developed anywhere. We have traditions that we we grow in, and I don't think various forms of external worship are good or bad. I think they're different in different traditions. I do think what matters is that worship is meaningful when we mean that worship. Now, what I don't mean is that you can come here and during the worship portion of our time together, you should like be a grump if you don't feel like worshiping. I think sometimes it's good to exercise the external of worship, because I do think that it's both directions. But what Mary has is authentic, spirit-filled soulful worship, and she specifically says, for God or to God, her Savior. Let me ask you a question. Last night they struggled with this. It's a hard question. Who is the Savior? Jesus. You guys did better. You guys did better than Saturday. They're like, is it God? Is it Jesus? Is it the Father? It's Jesus. In Luke, Jesus is the Savior. I'm going to show you some passages. Zechariah, when he's praying over his son, he says, and you child will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Simeon, when he witnesses or sees the young Jesus, says this, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your, what? Salvation. Salvation, That you have been, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. John the Baptist, just a chapter later, With the voice of one crying in the wilderness, he says, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Part of what Luke's doing when you read his gospel is he's saying to us, when you see Jesus, you are seeing salvation. When you see Jesus, you are seeing salvation. She praises God, her Savior. And then she says this in verse 48. For he has looked on the humble estate of a servant. Mary does have God's favor. Were you here last week when Pastor Zach preached on that? In many senses, though, Mary has a lot going against her. She has a humble estate. Mary was young. She was poor. She was powerless. She had no social or political cachet. She was the subject of a foreign military force that was in their land. And now she was endangered. She was with child and not yet married. Best case scenario, she's ostracized. Worst case scenario, she's executed. She's stoned. Mary might be asking, why me? I do think Mary realizes not only is she of humble estate, but Mary is also, like the rest of us, in need of a Savior. Mary was not in less need than we are. 
that she was faithful in many ways, but still required the righteous act of God. I want to read 49 and 50 real quickly. It goes, For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Three words she uses to describe God here that might help us understand what the good news of Jesus Christ is. The first word is holy. God is holy. God has never done anything wrong. He's completely perfect. Everything about him is good. Everything he has done and said is righteous and good and holy. There's no room for debate. He is perfect. We, on the other hand, are not. Are we perfect? No. I'm not. One way of of explaining this is to say, I think you know the things in your life that you've done that are not good. The larger theological narrative is our first parents, Adam and Eve, rebelled against God. They sinned against God. They decided to take their own way. And when they did that, sin and death and suffering enters into the world. And those who are meant to represent God can no longer even be in his presence because they're unholy and he is holy. And then this sin that is in some senses passed down because we're descendants of Adam and Eve is, is ratified by us in our own life when we sin against God and sin against other people. And along with being holy, God is just. He's going to deal with sin and with wickedness. And so like, that's like the bad news of the gospel is that the wrath of God is meant to be poured out on sinners, those who have offended God and offended others, and that's how we begin naturally as enemies of God, not friends of God. God is holy. Next word she uses, God is merciful. God did not stand by. He becomes man, whom we know as Jesus Christ, who we're reading about right here in this passage, who lives a perfect, righteous life, one we could not live, in our place. He goes to a cross where he dies a death that we could not have actually borne in our place. He carries no sin with him to the cross. He functions as our substitute. He trades places with us so that all who call on the name of Jesus might be saved. Lastly, mighty. God is able to save. You are not able to save. Not yourself, not anyone else but God is. Is there anyone in your life who who you've been praying for that you want to see come to faith? Anyone anyone out there praying for someone? Yeah. Don't stop praying. God is mighty. We read this in Acts. A little bit after Jesus' life, he ascends and the disciples are left and and the Spirit descends on on them. It's Pentecost and there's uh, Jews from all over the place because they've returned for a festival. So Peter has a good moment to give a sermon where all these different people are here. He says, then it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And towards the end of his sermon, we read this. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. This is a beautiful passage for most of us who are in this room because most of us today are Gentiles. Peter's saying, no one is excluded from this promise. I think the other thing that stands out really strongly to me about this passage is that God is clearly using weakness to display his own strength. Do you know that God will display his strength in our weakness? Do you know that's true? It's all over the Bible. Moses, you remember Moses? We talked about him a little while ago. Okay. Moses out in the desert. He sees the burning bush. He approaches and the Lord says to him, I'm going to send you back and you're going to deliver the people. And Moses is like, ah, I don't, I got a day job. I I watch sheep. I don't want to do that. God's like, well, we can do great things. I'll send your brother with you. And he's like, well, what if I go to my people? My people don't believe me that you sent me. And uh, 
God says, what's that in your hand to Moses? And what's in his hand? Yeah, but like the word is actually like stick. Like Moses is like, it's a stick? <laughs> and God's like, fine, I'll use that. And he uses a stick and brings about plagues and, and, and parts the sea. Like it displays God's power and weakness. How about David? You heard of David, right? David uh, was a lowly shepherd, the youngest son, kind of the runt, becomes king of Israel, the good king of Israel. How about Paul? Paul was a bad guy. He persecuted Christians. He went after them. He was complicit in the murder and martyrdom of many Christians. He was also sent out to be a witness, a mission, uh, on mission to the Gentiles, those who are not Jewish. Paul, who was very Jewish, who loves Judaism, who aches for his people, but he's sent out. Over and over again, we are seeing that God does not find the most powerful. He does not find the most established. He does not find the most clever people to bring about his purposes. He may use powerful or clever people, but often he uses weak people because when weak people are used, God's strength is highlighted. Like Mary is the one who is pregnant with the Messiah. Why wouldn't it have been Herod's wife or Caesar's wife or Caiaphas's wife? Why not Elizabeth and Zechariah? Why? I think it's important for us to see in stories like this that there is no room for human power in God's saving work. That is the wonderful and beautiful thing about Christianity. It is the only religion that I know of that rests not at all on human merit, on human action, on human righteousness, and rests entirely on the merit and the righteousness and the action of God. Mary rejoices in God's salvation. The gospel is God's doing. Thirdly, Mary is rejoicing in God's justice. Let's read 50 through 53. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. Now justice is a sensitive subject today, is that right? Like I just said justice, and some people are kind of nervous, like, is he going to say something that's going to offend me? Probably. (laughs) We are very obsessed with categories and all kinds of ways of thinking about justice. We disagree, probably even in this room, about what is just and what is unjust and who are the good guys and who are the bad guys, and it feels very confusing and it's difficult and it's dividing and it's spirited for some of us. I think when we look at a passage like this, we have to realize that we are kind of balancing two truths, the material and a spiritual truth. One is this, God does care about justice on earth now. He does. This is really common reversal language we see in the Bible over and over and over again. I'll show you one we already read in Psalm 138. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. The writers of the New Testament and of the Old Testament would often think about material justice. That God would side with those who are enslaved. That God would side with those who are being oppressed. That God would side with those who are sick and poor and alone. Over and over and over again we see this. And the the great story is the story of the Exodus that I already mentioned. Do the Israelites start out in a good spot in Exodus? They've been enslaved for hundreds of years. And then God delivers them powerfully. Brings them into this new place. He gives them a law which is partly designed to help prevent them from becoming like other nations that have awful systems that oppress people. Now, everyone's sufficiently stressed out? We good? Let me get some emails. I think if God loves something, we should love something. I don't think we're always going to agree on what's just and what's unjust. I don't think we're always going to agree on who the good guys are and the bad guys are. I think we can agree on this. In the end, God is going to get it right. That he'll dismantle every evil system. That he will tear every despot and tyrant down from their throne. That all injustices will be reversed. That God, who knows what actually is just, will make it right. That's good news. 
However, I think the more important truth here, the one that matters more, the one that I think is brought to bear on your own life and your own heart here this morning is the spiritual truth in that each of us are miniature tyrants who have claimed for ourselves the rights that only belong to God. We've, we've chosen against God as our ruler. We've taken for ourselves the things that we think belong to us, our moral agency or our right to rule or where we should direct our desires or affections. And we've said no to God. We've said yes to us. And we've set up little, many kingdoms in which we are our own tyrants. I don't think Christians are always humble. I think to be a Christian, you must be humbled. You must recognize your own need for a Savior, your helpless state before a holy God so that you might receive what he's given you. The gospel cannot be received begrudgingly. You can't be a grumpy receiver of the gospel. You try and feed your kids and they don't want to eat and you're like, eat your food. No one becomes a Christian against their will. See what I'm saying? It's not like a meal that you eat because you know it's healthy. It's a meal you eat because you're starving to death and you have to eat something. You realize you need help. Marriage rejoicing in God's word, in God's salvation, in God's justice, and, and then lastly, in, in God's commitment. We read, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. Mary, because she knows God's word, because she's devoted to God's word, she remembers God's promises. Does God make promises? She remembers this one from Genesis. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, look, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We read from Paul later in the New Testament a little bit more about what it means for Jesus to be the fulfillment of this promise to Abraham. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Mary is pregnant with a child whom she knows will bring about great things. I'm not sure how much she could have known. This child would not just change her life. It would not just change her family's life. It would not just change her nation's life or her generation's life. Her child would be the turning point of history in which all human beings, every single one, could respond to Jesus as Lord. These are big promises. But there's an even bigger promise. You guys like waiting on things? You're like, no. Mary was waiting. We're waiting. After Adam and Eve rebel against God, we have this scene where God is talking to the man, the woman, and then the serpent. And he says this to the serpent. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and your dust and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. It can seem strange today to talk about someone like the devil, the serpent, the ancient serpent, the deceiver. we are pretty comfortable talking about sin and wickedness. And I think those two things are related. But the idea is that there are people that oppose God. There's a person that opposes God. There's actions that oppose God. Is the world, like, totally good right now? Seems, excuse me, 
not going good. That in the one sense, Jesus has achieved what he's going to achieve at the cross. We still live in a world waiting for all the adversaries to be knocked down and for God to bring about his perfect future. The answer to that is the baby that, that Mary is about to give birth to. That he has come once and, Pope Chapel, he will come again. Look at, look at uh, Romans 16. At the end of Paul's longest and maybe greatest letter, we read, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Believer, it is right and it is good and you are able to rest in and rejoice in the promises of God because he keeps his promises. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. Thank you for the many ways that you have protected us and provided for us and blessed us. I pray that for the remainder of our service, we continue to honor you with our words and actions. For all these things, in the great name of your son, Jesus, amen.